this home in a $150,000 home or in a $1.8 million home, right? There's luxury to be found everywhere. Luxury to me is comfort, and it's also having access to materials and a home that give you comfort and convenience as well. That's the second factor is convenience, and it works for you. My name is Kevin McIntosh, and this is The Closing Table, where we talk to experts about their experience in real estate all across the country. Let's go. Closing Table Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin C. McIntosh. Join us on this episode. If you're ready to learn, we're getting ready to talk to a real estate professional. He goes by the name Naeem Amin. What's going on, Naeem? Hey, how you doing? Man, doing super good, man. Thank you for accepting my invitation to be a guest here on the Closing Table Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm excited yeah. to chat a little yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. So, I mean, uh, before I even start picking your brain about some stuff, I just want you to talk a little bit about yourself, Naeem. So tell us who you are outside of real estate. Yeah, for sure. So uh, besides real estate, you know, I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm a brother. Um, I've been living, you know, I grew up in uh, the Metro Detroit area. I've been living here my whole life. I was born here. I was raised here. Um, you know, my whole friends network is here. My family is here. Um, you know, I'm into a lot of different things besides real estate. Uh, real estate is, you know, top of mind for me these days. But, yeah. you know, I'm I'm into cars. You know, I'm kind of into fashion. And, um, you know, I, I just enjoy, like, spending time, like, checking out. You know, I'm into nature as well and, like, geography and nice. all that. Travel. Yeah, I've, I've got a lot going on. But, you know, real estate, you know, when you're an agent and you're an investor, that kind of takes over. So mm -hmm. that's my thing, you know, day-to-day. Uh, those are my activities for for my uh, on my daily, but <laughs> on the weekend a little bit different. Yeah, I feel it, man. Yeah, I feel it, man. You uh, you're, you're uh, you know, professional and 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 doing professional things during the day and Batman at night. I completely get it, man. But you know, taking care of business, family man, which we also love and respect here. Uh, adventurous, and you say a, a fashionista of some sorts, if that's appropriate. I I, I see you with the nice fashionable turtleneck, man. I got to give me some for winter. But, <laughs> that's fire, all right. fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Cool. So um, let's talk about your real estate business. I want you to kind of talk about it just in general, your whole strategies and, you know, you know what makes you stand out. But kind of segue into that by starting off how you got to be a real estate professional. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, actually, I I was always tagging along with my parents who were also into real estate investing. Um, and that's not their, you know, that's not their profession, but on the side when the market crashed there, you know, they saw homes, you know, really come on the cheap on the market. Mm -hmm. And I think they were looking at, you know, trying their hand at investing and, you know, they're, they're from Bangladesh and that country um, has gone through a very interesting uh, phenomenon with real estate where people used to own land, they used to own buildings and homes and whatnot. And the price of real estate in the last 20, 30 years back there has just skyrocketed. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't exactly the same over here. You know, there's still opportunity. I'm in Metro Detroit, Michigan. In Michigan, there's plenty of opportunity. You could mm -hmm. get land cheap. You can get homes pretty cheap. Commercial buildings were kind of on the rise at that time, around the time the market crashed back in uh, 08, 09 in the recession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when everything else started to take, they realized that they had an opportunity to invest in the market. So I would tag along with them, uh, <laughs> not of my own accord, but <laughs> de facto, I would just be there. And I'd be on all those Home Depot trips and meeting with those contractors and going to the homes and meeting tenants and all that. And I hated every part of it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> I just wanted mm -hmm. to go and, uh, you know, playing video games. Uh, yeah. But that really helped me learn the business. And that really helped me understand how to deal with contractors, how to interact with them, get quotes, how to, you know, negotiate on pricing, how to buy materials, where to go to buy materials, what materials to buy. And then also it, it taught me a lot about tenants and the tenant mindset and what Ooh. tenants are looking in a landlord and in a property. So, um, you know, I, I had that experience from 07 when they first, when they bought their first home all okay. the way through 14. And, um, as the years went on and I got older, I was given more and more responsibilities, uh, over the homes to like manage them and, you know, interact with tenants and renew leases and all that stuff. Um, and also fix problems. And I never really wanted to go into the real estate business myself. That wasn't really part of my um, plan. 
I just knew that I was, I wanted to do something in business and I felt like business really spoke to me. I didn't know what kind of business. I didn't know what to do in business. I didn't know if I wanted to own a business or work in someone else's business. I just knew that I liked the world of business and I wanted to have something of my own as well. So um, interestingly, my uh, my wife, yeah, she's my wife now. Um, at that time in 2014, she actually had gotten me a uh, real estate course uh, for my birthday. And I had the course and she had given it to me for my birthday. And it was like an interesting gift, you know? And, uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Eventually I ended up getting to it and I scheduled the course and I went in and I took the course and I was like, okay, well I took the course now. And, uh, you know, I, I still, at that time I wasn't interested in being a real estate agent. I, you know, I was just, okay, I have this course. I got it for my birthday. You know, I think it was honestly, maybe even from like Groupon or something. And I just took the course and I was like, well, I went through all that time and effort. I did the testing and all that. I might as well just take the state licensing exam, took the state licensing exam. I, you know, I passed, I got my license and I was like, well, now I have my license. Now, what am I going to do? Mm. And I was like, you know, do I really want to be a real estate agent or should I just keep it in my back pocket? And I was like, you know what? Just go out there and just see like what it's like. Let me try to be an agent. Let me just see if I, if, if there's anyone that even wants, I'm like, I was like, you know, I'm at that time I was like. I think I was like 26 and I was like, you know, who do I know that wants to buy real estate? Like, you know, all, most of my friends were like in college or they were starting their careers or they were young. And I was like, you know what, let me just try and be an agent and see what happens. So I started just, just very simply, I just listed on my Facebook, Hey, I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> you know, if anyone needs to buy or sell a house, you know, please give me a call. I'd love to consult with you and possibly help you out and be your agent. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to get any calls. I kid you not, I, f I posted on Facebook and like within like a month, I had like seven or eight clients oh, that wow. were like really looking to like buy and sell homes or like find investments. And I was shocked. And a lot of the clients that I got were people that I, w I weren't, I wasn't even targeting them, you know, like it would be like my friend's parents or my friend's older brother or like my uh... friend's you know, cousin that moved here from another state for mm -hmm. a job a demographic that was older than my age at that time, uh, who was actively buying. Um, so it may not have been a lot of my friends and whatnot, but, um, it was just really interesting to see those, uh, you know, getting access to like a demographic that I didn't even consider. And I wasn't even really trying to market. I just said, Hey, I'm a real estate agent. I just put it out there in the world. Um, and it's just funny because I have a business partner and him and I always talk. And, you know, the one thing I always tell him is, 75% of success is just like being a warm body and just being there, you know, the rest yeah. of it is like expertise and like your experience and how you communicate and your customer service. All of that is the rest of that 25%, but 75% is just like being available. Like, are you ready? Are you available? Yeah, I'm Man. here. I'm in a It's just crazy. Yeah. Availability is the best ability, man. That was a that was well said right there. Very, very interesting story, man. To learn a lot, man. Your your parents obviously getting you or you know, kind of getting you used to or warmed up to the real estate market and everything that they did. I completely understand wanting to be a kid at that time. I went around with my dad on some of those missions too, just didn't like it. But then when you get older, you realize that it was a lot to learn, a lot to take in. They were putting you on a path of success and putting you on a path to kind of helping you get ahead of the curve and learning some of these situations, man. Like you don't necessarily find a value in that until you get older. So it's, it's it was in divine order that you ended up in this position, do, being a real estate profession, a uh, professional, even though you didn't want to. So I, I completely understand. Very interesting. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And even the fact that you just put a Facebook post or social media post and you got reactions from that. That's very fortunate because that does not happen for everyone. That is the ideal for situations. Hey, I, I get my license as a real estate agent. Let me just make a status, blah, 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 and see what happens. But for people to actually respond and, and say, hey, I actually need your services, that doesn't happen all the time, man. So very fortunate situation. You, you obviously capitalized on it and became very successful. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, honestly, I didn't realize it at the time, but... I was not that active on social media, just in general. I haven't been, That's I'm crazy. even, <laughs> I'm not that active on, I'm not that, you know, engaged. The yeah. interesting, at that time, no agents. And I mean, almost zero were posting online. No one was thinking about social media as a tool for marketing their services.
and what they can do for clients. Nobody, and I mean like literally no one. We're talking so it's, 2014, right? You said 14, yeah, 14, 15. Yeah, yeah exactly. that sounds about That's, right. Yeah. And it started shifting in like 15, 16, you know, people started, you know, realizing that this is a very easy tool, free tool. Yep. They already have access to it. They already, you know, they have engagement, you know, on that platform already. Why not just market there? And it's just interesting because I, in the first two years, I marketed a lot on social media, but uh, subsequently I didn't need to market because I had word of mouth. So it's just funny. I kind of went yeah. the opposite direction that most agents went where they were mostly word of mouth and now they were on social media and even now you know today like it's so important for people so it's just very interesting man that is interesting that because i mean 10 years ago just think about it we're still we're still kind of early in the social media phase even though it's been out for what 15 20 or not 20 years but it's been out for a while yeah probably 20 years or so yeah for sure for sure but it's just so interesting because that is a hundred percent true. Like, and there's still agents to this day that's from that older era that really don't even mess with social media. Some of you'd be surprised, but I actually know you know. But it, it's it's crazy because you use it as a tool, you utilize it, and then other people start to see it or they start to get get wind of it. They use it as a tool. They start adding profiles, being active. By that time, you already built clientele. People already know you. So, like you said. Your business is starting to turn over from lead generation to referral and word of mouth. And then wow. while you're doing that, they're all jumping on on social media, trying to do the same thing and play catch up. Lo and behold, the algorithms are changing. So now your approach to even be noticed on social media is completely different. So it seems like you're ahead of the curve or you were ahead of the curve and you constantly are on that on that front. And you have to be in a competitive market with real estate agents. I get it. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of those things happen. I feel like, and I've talked to a lot of people in business and, you know, other agents and other business people, a lot of those things happen when you least expect it or when you don't plan for them. You just kind of yeah. stumble up. I feel like, yeah. you know, there, that, that element of luck associated with business, that's kind of like, for me, that was just like a lucky break. Like, it's not like I could have predicted the timing. It's not like I was planning for it. That mm -hmm. was like, break for me that helped me get attention and even now like throughout my friends group and my community and my you know social circle people know oh yeah that's not him like that's the real estate guy like nice. he's the he's the agent just by chance because of that initial social media exposure that i had that i was able to monopolize on without planning or scheduling or anything you know i just i just did it and again Good it's work. that that 75 percent of just being a warm body just doing it just being mm -hmm. there half mm -hmm. and i feel like half being an agent is just like being there you know, then the other half is like being knowledgeable and all that. I'd right. say it's even so in business. You know, yeah. I need a coffee or there's a coffee shop. Like you're just a warm body. You're just available. And you're providing that service or that good. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. No, no, it definitely is. Yeah, you you definitely uh, touched on that too, man. That's a great point. I want to lean into to where you're doing your business, though. So you're, you're giving so much insight into, you know, kind of how you got to where you got to. So let's talk about where it is. You already talked about it. We mentioned Detroit, Detroit, Michigan. So... I love to get everyone's different perspective of their market, right? Because, I mean, even though there's plenty of agents there, everyone will probably give a different answer. So describe your market geographically. Just paint a picture for those who may have never been there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, do you mean in regards to, like, my area of operations or do you mean, like, Correct. what the market is? No, your area of operation first, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say my general area of operations would be from Ann Arbor on the west all the way to like uh, Clinton Township, Macomb, and Shelby on the east. So I covered wow. that. You know, that's from west to east. And then north to south, I would say it's from Rochester all the way down to Detroit and Dearborn. So that's okay. my north. So it's it's all of Oakland County, large areas of uh, Washtenaw County, large areas of Macomb County, and, uh, you know, a lot of Wayne County. Almost gotcha. all of yeah. Got gotcha. you. Okay, cool. That is that is a very wide span area if you ask me personally probably like a like an hour drive from you know ann arbor maybe all the way to rochester or something like that maybe just about an hour a little bit maybe a little bit more now that i think about it but okay that's not too bad you cover a pretty decent region within michigan but can you talk about that same region that you serve in terms of economics the data for real estate do you have any numbers that you can kind of give us to kind of have us test the or, or check the temperature for what that market is really looking like in regards to real estate. Yeah, I mean, in general, the general market condition in all those areas is that it's super hot. And it's hot for 
sellers because there's just so there's so many buyers. There are many, many buyers in the market. And it even with the higher interest rates, from my experience, from from my clients that I serve, um, there's just there are not enough homes to go around. Inventory is at an all time low in all those markets. Rochester, Kent, and Ann Arbor, Bloomfield, Detroit, like everywhere, there's just, there's not enough inventory and there's just a lot of growth going on. There are new homes, you know, there are new construction homes um, that are being built to cater to some of that need, but the amount of buyers, um, the volume is just very, very high. And thus you have a very competitive market when you're, you know, a part of that buyer's group and you're trying to buy a home. So sellers, you know, they have a lot of, first of all, they have a lot of leverage um, but secondly, they also have options. So you have leverage because you can, you know, get a higher price and you can kind of stand firm and you will eventually get close to what you're asking for if it's within reason and you've done proper comps and all that. Mm -hmm. And if the kid that's listing the home, you know, if they've reasonably given a, a, a realistic expectation to the seller, they're going to get close to what they're asking. I mean, even now, they're given, you know, depending on the location, certain cities, they're going over asking price. And that's just a common thing. Even now, you know, the very yeah. hot markets, like for example, the McCombs or uh, the Farmington Hills, um, you know, depending on where the Ann Arbor too. Yeah. Ann Arbor. Absolutely. Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Ann Arbor. So, you know, right now sellers have a lot of leverage and they also have a lot of options. So you may get on a given deal as a seller, you may get two home, uh, two buyers that are trying to buy your home. And one might bring a very, very strong mortgage offer. A financed offer and another one might bring a cash offer and you can just pick and choose and you have options you know and it's it was different than than when i first started in 2014 15 16 17. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really in 18 it started to heat up um but in those first you know four years it wasn't like that you know you were happy to get you, as a seller you were happy to receive an offer on your home and there was a little bit of negotiation and you know the buyer knew the seller knew there's going to be some you know flexibility in the pricing perhaps it's just totally different now, you know, and yeah. has slowed down for sure because of the higher interest rates. Um, but they've they're starting to cool, and again, that was during the um, the high interest rates were during the winter time, which is the off season, anyways, and it was still hot, you know. So I think inventory is going to be a problem moving forward. But in general, the markets, you know, the market condition to go back to the area of operations and all that, where I work and where I service my clients' needs, almost every home has a, a multiple offer scenario. And if it does, mm -hmm. you can expect to invest some money into it when you're when you're going to purchase. You can expect yeah. that it's going to need repairs or some updates. So you have yeah. to have cash. You have to be yeah. ready. I think that sweat equity is very, very important, man, whether you're a first time home buyer or not. I mean, just based off the range that you served, I mean, the area, we're talking about a wide range of pricing, man, from I'm pretty sure you deal with anything probably below 200,000 all the way up to million dollar properties going from Detroit to Rochester to Ann Arbor and Farmington Hills. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. So you have to be very, very com competitive, a little bit smart. You want to work with the overall, you want to work with the right agent who would, you know, either have a good reputation amongst other agents, some type of rep, you know, a good, um, uh, rapport with other agents also and you also want to make sure that they're negotiating you know things that can give you a little bit of leverage when when homes and properties are getting multiple offers because not all sellers are looking for the highest cash offer the highest bid there, it could be other contingencies too so uh it, it's it's great that you spoke on that especially with the range. I, I i'm still just thinking about the range that you're dealing with in regards to the different cultures the different environments plus not plus the prices you got to be very, very knowledgeable. And then, like you said, you got to show up. You have to be there for those clients too, man. So uh, I, I think that's well said. Um, uh, anyone who's looking to purchase a home now, just get in. There's never going to necessarily be a perfect time. I mean, you, we, we've heard, what, four years as of now. It's been very, very competitive since the pandemic for buyers. I mean, and you're still looking to get a, a, a pretty decent deal as a seller now, that, even in the Michigan area. So. I just want to add on to that um, with that being said. But I, I do know that you also have experience in, in luxury properties also, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, yeah, I have, uh, right. I have a certain amount of experience with the luxury yeah. properties. Yeah, right. absolutely. So and what been, about... Oh, go then, ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm very big into design. I, you know, I'm very much into yep. architecture. Yep. I, I actually started learning a little bit about like home construction as well. Um. There's just a lot of things that are related to being a real estate agent that go hand in hand. And if you're interested in a given, 
you know, direction, you can definitely just branch out and become more knowledgeable and have more experience with certain things. So I know, yeah. for example, some agents that I know, it's not many, but some that I know they have their builder's license. Some of them are also, you know, certified or they have like uh, courses and like, uh, you know, accreditations for being an interior designer. So that's very interesting. You know, so I think that, and, and I actually know that a lot of, a lot of builders are actually real estate agents and actually some architects too are also real estate agents. So it's very interesting. It's not many, but there, there are those little niches too, if you want to kind of branch out. So luxury for me is like, you know, for me, it's all about design and like, I'm very much into like modern design and contemporary design and, you know, like I'm, I'm very much into materials and like what materials, you know, are like certain, you know, renovations or homes built with, or like what kind of materials are they putting into like you know, like rehabs and like historic Detroit buildings and all that stuff. There's a lot that's that's on the table. But for luxury, I'm I'm definitely very interested in that. Has there been any examples or memories uh, from your experience that you kind of put those powers to good, those design skills and those uh, uh, other type of home project skills? Have you put those to use for a client by any chance? You got any examples you can tell us? Yeah, so uh, actually, I have a couple of examples, but... I think one very interesting example would be um, I had a client who was an elderly lady. Um, in fact, she was a senior citizen and she was downsizing and she lived in Canton and she was moving from Canton. She had a typical, you know, a two or 3000 square foot house mm -hmm. uh, built in 90s, you know, kind of like a cookie cutter style. Yeah. And, you know, it was just too much home for her. And it had a stair, you know, it had staircase uh, with all the bedrooms upstairs and she wanted to go down to a ranch. So I helped her identify a property. It was actually a HUD home in Auburn Hills. And so, you know, obviously a HUD, you know, it being a HUD home, it had been foreclosed by HUD and therefore, you know, it was kind of in derelict condition and whatnot. So we kind of, we, we strategized as to how to make it comfortable for her in her, um, you know, older years and transitioning to like a ranch from a colonial, how to renovate it and all that stuff. We kind of discussed like different materials. And, you know, I, I like to act as a, um, as a hub you know, as much as I can, I like to have resources ready for my clients. So I was able to refer her to, you know, different places that sell tile, different places that sell, you know, hard flooring, like whether it's engineered hardwood or laminate or, you know, what else I, I was able to refer her to like some electricians, um, you know, plumbers, uh, some people that do carpentry work and general labor and window companies. So I like to have a, uh, you know, a so-called Rolodex ready for my clients so that I could help guide them uh, when they're trying to make a transition, but they're, you know, going after a property that will need some repair or some TLC. And uh, yeah. so in this case, you know, I kind of helped her with the design as well. You know, it's not like I sat and I drew out like cat or anything, but we, you know, <laughs> I did a company with, you know, I accompanied her to some of those kitchen design places as well. And I didn't, you know, that was just extra stuff that I didn't get compensated for, but yeah, I yeah. did. Well, it's one of my valuable clients. You know, I really value all my clients and I want to make sure that I can, I can also, if I, first of all, I value them, but I also like to provide value to them as well. Um, and I think one of the ways in doing that is just being an expert in it, you know, in as much as possible, you know, and there if I'm go. not, an expert, so I can point her in the right direction to where the experts are. Yeah, man. So yeah, that was a good experience. And she re she ended up redoing uh, two, one and a half bathrooms. She did all the flooring, the windows, the kitchen was brand new with all new cabinetry, granite countertops, stainless steel sinks, stainless steel appliances. I even sent her to like ABC warehouse and I have like a contact there that I sent her to so she could get a good deal. Um, you know, I try to do that for my clients. So that's just one of a couple of examples that I have. And obviously, you know, luxury, you're asking about luxury. A lot of luxury, in my opinion, is like a mindset, right? It's like a lifestyle, right? You could, mm. you could live in this home at, in a $150,000 home or in a $1.8 million home, right? There's luxury to be found everywhere. Luxury to me is comfort and it's also having access to materials and a home that give you comfort and convenience as well. That's the second factor is convenience and it works for you. So it's more of a mindset bars. and a bars, bro. Bars. I'm so glad you added that. That is perfect, man. Cause there's no specific definition as to what luxury is. It's subjective if you want to be technical. Yeah, you you have what people call luxury items and high end or whatever the case may be. That could be luxury to you, but it can it could be low end for somebody else. So whatever you define as luxury, I like how you said luxury is comfort and convenience. I would one hundred percent agree with that. One hundred percent. It's you. Were you going to say something? You going to ask something? 
Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, you know, like I mentioned, I'm, you know, I, I've been into fashion a lot, and I realized just, you know, from the fashion world, luxury, you know, you have all these luxury brands, and mm -hmm. what makes like what about it is luxury is it the actual brand and the name or is it the craftsmanship and the quality it's the craftsmanship and the quality in my opinion right that's what i would say so if you have a, a home regardless of the size or the price point if you put quality materials in there by crafts people who are actually craftsmen then you have luxury in my opinion you just yeah. don't have the brand you have luxury though no, you know I, that's all yeah. no that's a good I, i'll even go as far as to say just kind of building on what you said before, it's also the perception of value, because if yeah. the if if the market or the you know demand for it is you know seeing it as nothing valueless, then it, where's the luxury in that? So I, I think that's a big part of it too. Is it's 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 that's the whole conversation of price versus value, and value is basically a perception type of thing. So uh, no, I, I'm sorry to step on your toes, but I definitely want to add on to that. that, that well said, well said. But, I'm, with, with, I'm, with I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you 100%. I agree 100%. Okay. Value okay, is cool, super. Cool. In fact, uh, part of my onboarding process, like, you know, I have talks with my clients when I first, you know, sign the paperwork and I first, you know, agree to like be their agent. The number one thing, especially for buyers, the one thing I always say is that we're buying on value. It doesn't matter if you're buying at 1.8 million. It doesn't matter if you're buying at 50,000. It doesn't matter what price point you're buying on value. You will never lose if you buy on value. Always Ooh, look for them. Yeah, yeah. It's determined by a multitude of factors. We can get into that a little bit later. But always buy on value. That's the most. Gotcha. Forget about. Forget about you know certain things like you know if certain things look pretty but they're highly priced. You know don't mm -hmm. get acted by some of the bells and whistles. You know focus mm -hmm. on value. I always say that. I agree a hundred. I'm so happy you brought that up actually. Yeah man. It's yeah man. No, nah, we piggyback. That's the energy. We exchange energy right now. I like that, bro. So when you when you mentioned helping a, a senior kind of downsides, it made me think about something I saw when I was researching. You you mentioned something about a getaway retirement villa, and I just instantly was like, man, I need that right now. I want to retire <laughs> now. But I, I, let's go into a situation where you did help somebody find, uh, I, I guess what you would call a, a re retirement situation. You know, uh, maybe a home or property that they obtained after they retired to kind of help them settle. And then talk about how you helped them settle in after that, too. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm glad you asked. So in regards to like retirement, so retirement planning occurs at different stages in life for, for different clients, right? Mm -hmm. Some people yeah. are in their 30s and they're thinking about it now. That yeah. uh, client that I had that I was telling you about, she was already in retirement age. So she, you know, that's when she started to to plan for it and downsize and get that home ready for herself. I have a client that's currently uh, also in retirement age right now actively. And he's looking for his retirement home. But retirement also means different things to different people, right? Ooh. So, for example, the one of the clients I have right now, he's going to retire, right? He's going to retire, but um, his son is going to move in with him as well, with his wife. So their idea of retirement isn't necessarily downsizing as much as it is finding a home that works for everyone, Right. So, so that's one example. So that's an ongoing search, right? Um, that client I mentioned to you, you know, she had a successful search with her retirement, you know, her retirement plan. So I have another client. Um, he's one of my best friends. He's also in his thirties and him and his wife live in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And just last month, he actually closed on a condo that it wasn't intended to be retirement, right? It was intended to be a second home with an income property, but it could very well transition into being a retirement home as well. So they they purchased a condo up in uh, Traverse City, and that, as you know, I mean that's like a mecca for like retirement yeah, and for yeah. vacation. So it's kind of a flex property, right? And it could and the whole purpose of buying it not only as an income property, secondary home, the whole purpose in buying it was so that it could be a long term proposition. And what is more long term than retirement, right? That's the definite. I mean, that is what you want out of a property ultimately. Can it be a feasible retirement uh, investment for you as an investor as a as a homeowner, right? There you go. So that, that's another example of like, you know, buying. That's kind of like, and it's like value, right? When you're buying on value, you're buying flexibly and you have options down the line, right? Because, right. you know, you have different, you know, your needs change over time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your finances change, your needs change, your lifestyle changes. So you, if you bought on value, you have that value that you can tap into or you can utilize. Or 
uh, if you buy on like if you buy flexible properties, you can change the use case of the long term plan if needed. So that's yeah. an example right there. So yeah, man. It was a, yeah, man. It took time, but I you know I learned a little bit about Traverse City as well in the process. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, but I've heard the exact same thing. Great retirement city in Michigan, beautiful view, great for tourism and stuff like that. So it's not like it's a super boring town or anything like that. So I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a great place for people to consider if they are, you know, in that retirement phase of life, specifically here in Michigan, too. So but your Absolutely. your your expertise or expertise also expands into uh, in, in investment properties. One investment that I love, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this, house hacking. When an owner buys a property, a, a multi-unit property, duplex, triplex, quad, they live in one space and then they rent out the other ones and that rent money pays for their mortgage, essentially. Has there been a situation where you explain this house hacking uh, technique to a client and you actually had them take that approach to owning and investing in properties? Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, it's funny. I've explained it many times, <laughs> but successfully, I've had one client so far that was able to house hack ah. success. Um, and it went well. I, and I'll, you know, I'll give you this scenario, but I will say, I'll make this note too. Every young person is trying to find a property to house hack. House yeah. hacking is very, very hot right now. It's very popular and everybody wants to house hack, but it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before with the inventory problem. There just aren't a lot of duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes for sale around here. Yeah. There are some that pop up, you know, in, in our area, in the area that I operate, uh, but not too many. And though yeah. some of them that pop up are, you know, they, they're in need of a lot of work. So that automatically precludes a lot of young people who don't have a lot of money to That's put into the property yeah. beyond buying it and closing on it. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you an example. So um, I have a, you know, a big part of my network is, is doctors and a, a lot of young doctors too. So I had this, uh, he actually came as a uh, word of mouth referral. Uh, from another friend of mine, but uh, there was this young guy and he was just entering residency at uh, DMC hospital system in downtown Detroit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, you know, he met with me and he's like, Hey, I need to buy something. I don't want to rent. You know, I want to own something, this and that. So we started kind of talking about his goals and his finances and what he plans to do after his residency. Cause residency is a fleeting time, right? You're going to be a resident for anywhere between three years to maybe seven years, 10 years or more. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you're going to settle down. So if I do residency at DMC Detroit, there's, you know, who's to say that I'm not going to end up settling down in Grand Blank or Traverse City or somewhere, right? There's no guarantee. So he, the idea that I gave him was, look, you don't know where you're going to be in three years. That was the length of his residency specifically. I was like, you don't know where you're going to be in three years. So why don't you consider buying a property that you can rent out afterwards very easily and it financially will make sense, right? Mm -hmm. And so instead of looking at a property where you're buying it for four or $500,000 in the suburbs um, and then you know you go to rent it, sure, you can rent it for a decent amount, but you're never gonna make a, a, a reasonable return on that four or $500,000, right? Versus looking at a duplex or a quadplex, right? You buy it in you know a similar price point, four or 500,000, um, but you can rent out so many of the other units and once you've moved out, if you end up leaving, then you can rent yours out as well and, you know, cover the cost and make a little bit of profit on top. And it's, you have a lot more flexibility and all that. So nice. we just, you know, house hacking and we actually were able to successfully identify a duplex and it took us a while, you know, we shopped for about, I would say four months. So he came to me in, I think July and we had a conversation, you know, I kind of gave him the talk and I gave him a couple ideas. And then, you know, we started aggressively looking in August and he actually, we identified the property in January. So it took a long time. And this was actually 2020. So you know what happened in January 2020. Everything was just shut down and everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during that process, it kind of, it gave us a little bit of uh, opportunity. And again, you know, this is that part of luck. This is where that little bit of luck comes into play. Because we we're looking and we we're looking and we, you know, we had identified quadplexes, triplexes. But whatever we identified, either the cost was too high to justify the purchase or the taxes were too high, or it needed a lot of work. When we identified this property, not only did it not need any work, it was almost turnkey, um, but it was in a very desirable location. It was in Troy, Michigan, Ooh, which okay, who knows? You know, Troy is you know known for having really good schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, interestingly, uh, we identified the duplex. 
Um, the agent also, this is the other part of that luck, right? The agent also, uh, the listing agent was an agent out of my office that I had never met before. But she was an agent out of my office. So we identified the property. I gave her a call. I said, hey, I've got this solid buyer. You know, he's a young doc and he's trying to get started. He's going to house hack. You know, I was very upfront with her about what our intentions were. And, you know, we kind of discussed some pricing and all that. And luckily we were able to make a deal happen and he was able to purchase the property. And he lived in it for almost uh, almost two years, I believe. Nice. So it was an awesome experience. Yeah, and it was great. He lived on one side. The other side had a tenant that had been there for a long time. He, The tenant, you know, had gotten married in this, you know, in the time of his ownership. And he loved the property and he got a new job. And he was just so happy, like, living in that location, in that place, um, in his side of the duplex. And he was just, like, the happiest tenant ever. So it ended up being a really good experience, you know? Man, changed their yeah. life for the better, like, for the rest of their life, man. Created wealth. Uh, something that they can pass on to their kids, cash flow. And it's all because they got what a very experienced and knowledgeable agent like yourself, Naeem, man. That's that's great, great work right there. Um, Real quick, if you don't mind, man, I kind of want to just get some inspiration from you. Um, Is there a movie, book, quote, or philosophy overall that you kind of live by that helps shape your life personally or professionally that you can share with us? Yeah, um, that's a great question. You know, I have a lot of, you know, any realtor can tell you there's so many resources online, right? You can go to this website, that website, you know, Architectural Digest, whatever it might be. But I have to go back, you know, when it comes to philosophy and like shaping my life, I have to go back to the roots, which would be my religion. And I'm Muslim, you know, I practice, you know, the teachings of Islam. Mm -hmm. And you know, I feel like Islam ha has really changed so many things for me for the better. And, you know, the more I learn about it, the more I practice it, the more Muslims that I meet, you know, it's there's some very, very special brotherhood that I feel uh, meeting other Muslims. And there's something very special I feel about practicing my religion and being devoted to God and following the teachings of our prophets. It's I feel like that's what's kept me grounded. And that's a big okay. thing for me, you know, and that's that also helps. I feel like keep me humble because I want to keep growing. I want to get better and better every day. I really do. And I want to provide the utmost best in service and customer care for my for my you know clients. Man. So I feel like my religion has been a lot. You know, it's it's everything to me, and it's shaped who I am. And I do feel like uh, because of you know me being you know like trying to be you know at least as much as possible a devout Muslim, um, that's really what's helped me uh, just keep going forward. You know, and staying in like a straight path and moving forward in a straight line. Yeah, man. I love that, man. It, it keeps you rooted, keeps you grounded, takes you back to your foundation. You know, what you were taught at a young age instilled in you and just puts great principles and values, man. So, man, great, great discussion. Great talk, Naeem. And thank you so much for pulling up a chair to the closing table, too, by the way. At this point, if you have any last words or want to tell people how they can reach out to you, the floor is yours. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. Um, They're welcome to email me. Uh, it's just my last name, A-M-I-N period, my first name, N-A-Y-E-E-M at gmail.com. Uh, they're welcome to reach out. You know, I, I work a lot with investors and young people that want to invest and people who are transitioning into retirement who want to invest. Um, and they're looking for multifamily, you know, investments, mm -hmm. family investments, even vacant land investments, commercial investments. You know, I, I do a little bit of everything. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to do the best for my clients day in and day out. Uh, they can also check me out um, online. I'm on Facebook. It's just my name, Naeem, N-A-Y-E-E-M-A-M-I-N. And I'm also on Instagram as well. And I'll send you the link. Maybe you can throw it at the bottom of the video. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you again, Naeem. We appreciate you. For our YouTube audience watching right now, if you've gotten to this point in the video, do us both a favor. Hit that like button, subscribe, and share. Do the same thing if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Give us a like, a five-star rating, and subscribe to our channel. i also like to leave our audience with a question to have them think, Naeem. So this is for our audience. As an investor or a landlord of a rental property, what are your most effective ways to market for occupancy? Don't tell us now, leave it in the comments below. Besides that, we'll talk to you next.